suffering is, is, is nothing new for anyone who, who lives in this world. And sometimes the world view, view suffering, even though it's common and it's everywhere, the world view suffering as injustice, as unjust. Some even decidedly, beca because they're suffering abound around us, they decidedly not wanting to give themselves to have faith in the God of the Bible or to, to believe in God because, because of the suffering around them that they witness. They say, like, if there is so much suffering and injustice in the world, I cannot believe in God of the Bible, who God of the Bible claimed to be God of love, that God is love. So, so we've been studying the book of Daniel together for couple of weeks now. This is our third week on the book of Daniel. We get to chapter three and we have come to know Daniel and his three friends, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were the bright young Jews who were taken into exile by the Babylonians uh, to serve in the, in the new home, in their new home in exile. The questions for us that we must ask this morning is this, how can we find God in suffering and how can we live a faith-filled life in the midst of suffering? So that's what we're going to look at, um, the question of suffering and how we can live a faith-filled life in the midst of suffering. See, the reason I, I want to talk about that is because Daniel chapter 3 is no doubt one of the most faith-filled chapters in our entire Bible. It tells the story of uh, Daniel's three friends. We've been focusing a lot on Daniel, but today we're going to focus on Daniel's three friends and Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the face of a serious threat, a death threat, um, death by fire. So that's what we're going to look at. So through Daniel chapter 3, we're going to learn three things. And the three things are the opposition of faith, the test of faith, and the triumph of faith. So the opposition of faith, the test of faith, and the triumph of faith. So we're going to, in essence, we're going to talk about suffering and faith, how they interact with one another, how, you know, how we should live, how should we thrive in this world that is unjust and full of suffering. So the first thing is the opposition of faith. So have a look at chapter 3 verse 1. I hope you have your Bible with you um, so you can follow along. It's easier because we're, we're not in person. There's no slides that show you the scripture. If you have your Bible with you, uh, look at verse 1 in chapter 3. It says this, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits and set it upon the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, straight away in the, in the, in the beginning of chapter 3, it says Nebuchadnezzar set up an image, a golden image that is huge. This is, six, this is about 30 meters high. And if you live in an apartment, imagine a 30-story, a uh, no, 30 meters, a seven-story building. It's huge. It's big. And in, in chapter 2, he was just being warned by Daniel about his dream about a, a giant golden image that was shattered by a stone. Now, in chapter 3, uh, he set up an image that is made of gold that is as high as 30 meters. That is remarkable, isn't it? Considering what has come before, the warning and the message in the previous chapter. So let's read on from verse 2 to 3. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that the King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the, in the justices, the magistrates, and all the, the all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that the king that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar 
had set up. Well, notice the repetitions of list here. A lot of repetition, isn't it? Like verse 2 and verse 3, you know. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar gathered the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces. And then come the next verse, verse 3. So King Nebuchadnezzar called this, gathered them up. And verse 3 says, then all these people, the satraps, the prefects, and so on, they gathered now, this is conformity. This is a sign of conformity, of obedience. Precisely what the king commands is precisely what happens. And that's what the book of Daniel in this chapter tells us and wanting us to see. The conformity of the, the, the people, the exact groups of people were mentioned who were called. They, they requested to be present and just like machines, just like robots, they came and they obey and they bow down. So that's what happened. Conformity is demanded of the people by the king. Um, living in a plural, pluralistic and polytheistic society. And as soon as you question it, no one question it, you see, by this point. But as soon as you qu question it, they will call you enemies. They will call you names. They will, they will persecute you. And that's what will happen. So none of them question anything just like robots they came and obey and they bow down and another example of conformity is this uh, let's continue on reading from verse 4 to 7 and the herald proclaim aloud you are commanded O people nations and language that when you hear when you hear the sound of the horn pipe lyre trigon harp bagpipe and every kind of music you are to fall down and worship the golden image that the king Nebuchadnezzar has set up and whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the people heard, again, here's the repeating uh, list of things, the sound of horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the people's nations and language fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So here again, the repeat list of the music. Again, the, the list of instruments get repeated uh, two more times in, in the chapters. So we are not told uh, when it comes to the image, the golden image uh, that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. We are not told about what is the image. We are not told and I think that is not relevant. However, the implication is clear. It's an object that the people are ought to bow down and worship. To obey the king and conformity is required because in it means swearing their allegiance to the king to the government to the Babylonian government they they do not dare therefore questioning the king's command let alone disobey his command and and this is not good isn't it when you can't even question it because knowing if you question this you might get uh, put into a uh, a fiery furnace so they did not dare to disobey nor question even question the king so conformity is what we see here and also um, in this climate of polytheistic like Babylonian polytheistic and uh, where they worship many gods and pluralistic many cultures coming in many languages it says many people many races many languages come uh, However, that's all good. People say it's harmony. There's harmony in, in differences. There's tolerance. But however, as soon as you have a different belief, when you question or disobey um, with what the majority, what the, the Babylonian king um, commanded, then you will face opposition. So it's only tolerance up until you questioned the authority. Or you disobey the authority. And let us read that. Uh, what happened to Daniel's three friends. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Because they question. They refuse to obey. What happened to them? Let's read from verse 8 to 12. Look at your Bible. Let's read together. Therefore at that time. Certain Chaldeans came forward. And maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, 
O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears, here's the repeat list, the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning fiery furnace. Now there are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Notice, in, uh, when the oppositions come, they, 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 they are coward, they hide themselves. In this case, they basically simply mention as certain Chaldeans came forward. They are not named, but they name the certain Jews. Do you see that? So certain Chaldeans came forward, accused the certain Jews, and they were named Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now they came to inform the king of the Jews' disobedience. By doing so, these certain Chaldeans imply their own obedience. See, that's their agenda, you see. Now, at the end of uh, chapter 2, we will let, let me read for us. Um, verse 49. This is the last verse in chapter 2. Let's see where were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego by the end of chapter 2. Daniel made a request to the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. So by this time, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are at least have hold a significant position in the provinces of Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They may not be the leader or the governor or whatever in that provinces, but at least they, were, they hold an official uh, position in the provinces of Babylon. So the opposition perhaps came with the agenda of, you know, this guy need to be punished so I can gain from their punishment. These certain Chaldeans want to take advantage of this, you see. So that's why they came to inform the king of their disobedience. Now, see how in verse 2, in, at the end of verse 2, Daniel chapter 3, verse 2, at the end of it, it says this, These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods and worship the golden image that you have set up. Do you see that? It's a, it's a focus on you, king, you, king. Image you have set up. They pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods. Um, they, the opposition makes sure that the king take this offense personally. It's not like they did not worship, bow down to the image. Well, they did not listen to you, king. They did not um, bow down to the image that you have made, that you have set up. So in essence, what they're saying is, what you're going to do about it, king, to these three people. Now, um, irreligious people like the oppositions um, and also the people of our day, the irreligious people of our days, um, often accuse nonconformity towards religious people and they say, they label, they label it as intolerance. Okay, so we have that opposition as well and we are labeled as intolerance and even bigotry, which is even stronger, I think. And perhaps sometimes that is true. Uh, perhaps sometimes that's true. However, the questions I want to ask on this, at this point is this. Have you been opposed as a Christian? If you're a Christian, have you been opposed because of what you believe in your life? Have you been opposed because of what you believe to be true in your life? I'm talking specifically being opposed to what you hold true uh, word of God, what you believe in the Word of God, have you been opposed in your life? If you have not, then the next question that we must ourselves honestly is this, why not? Why, if I believe in God of the Bible and His commands, have I never experienced oppositions in my life for what I believe? So that's what we must ask as Christians. Is it cowardice? Is it cowardice that caused us never to experience the opposition? Have, or have we become so conformed through 
the belief and the ideology of this world, this society, that we have found no opposition. Paul writes in Romans 12 verse 2, um, let me read for us if you, if you can be quick in turning to Romans. That's good. Romans 12 verse 2, it says this, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Do not be conformed to this world. That's, that's, the, that's advice, not advice, it's commands um, from the Apostle Paul in the Bible to Christians. Now, should Christians do precisely what the king of our days precisely commands? Should we do precisely what the kings of our days commands? <clears throat> Before we go further, I just want to say that there's at least one major difference between uh, religious people and, and Christians, okay? And when it, especially when it comes to obedience, and we'll see this in our next points, uh, especially when it comes to obedience, religious people obedient uh, for, for different reasons to why Christians obey. And that has to do with motivation as to why we obey. This leads us to our next point, the test of faith. So we have uh, opposition to our faith and then the test of our faith. When we believe that the Bible is the word of God, that what we have before us is the word of God, we will live by what is written in it. There's, there's no way out about it. If we believe this is the Word of God, the very Word of God, the Bible, then we will live by what is written in it. If we don't, then somehow, even though we may not confess it, we have doubt that this is truly the Word of God. So, but when we do so, when we believe this is the Word of God, and when we live by what is written in it, when we do so, we will surely face opposition in life. And the test of faith will come. Now, by, by making the, the non-conformity of, of these three Jews known to the king, the opposition is telling the king, do something about these three people. What are you going to do now? You said you're going you're gonna to throw people into the burning fiery furnace. Are you going to do that to these people? That's, that's what this certain Chaldeans, unknown certain Chaldeans, are asking the king to do. Let's read from, uh, continue on reading from uh, verse 13 to 15. Daniel 3, verse 13 to 15. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought, so they brought this man before the king. Again, another conformity there by the men, Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods and worship or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, that's the fourth repeat of that list, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Now, the king asked Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego a question here, right? He wanted to find out himself. He just didn't want to hear from a, you know, a third party, these certain Chaldeans. He asked them, Oh, is it true, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my God or worship the golden image that I have set up? So that's the question. Interestingly, the king could not bother to wait for the answer. Do you notice that? The king did not bother to wait for Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to answer. And then the king say, well, in, in essence, forget about what has done before. Um, now, if you are ready. When you hear the sound of the horn and pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, now you fall down and worship the image that I have made. Well and good. I will forgive if you didn't do it before, but if you do now, well and good. I won't punish you if you didn't do it before. You see what happened there? If they do that, all is well. 
Now I want to mention this is this is the mark of a polytheistic society. This is the doc, this is the belief of a polytheistic society. This is poly, polytheistic, the, theistic, pluralistic um, tolerance. You see. In, in this kind of society, there is a pretense of tolerance. The king is tolerant towards Yahweh, the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You see, he is tolerant towards them as long as they would worship the idol golden image that the king has set up. This is a, a pretense. Uh, this is not a real tolerance, not a true tolerance. See, the, the king's concern here is not their faith in Yahweh, but their conduct towards him, towards the king. In other words, the king say to, you know, people like you and me today, on Sunday, you can go to church. Christians, you freely worship. You can go to church. You can sing your song in church. You can pray. You can read your Bible. I have no issue with that. However, you must also obey what I say even if it contradicts what your Bible says. You can sing, you can go to church, you can worship, you can believe all you can believe, for as long as you also obey what I say, what I commanded, even if it is contradicting what the Bible says. See, that is tolerance in our polytheistic, pluralistic society. And... Well, everyone has obeyed so far. We read in conformity to the king and not so with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They did not want any of it. Uh, there's this kind of faith in them. Um, what they say next breaks the conformity for the first time. You see how when the king requests list of people and then it says the, this list of people come. When, when the list of music been, instruments been played, they will bow down and worship, and they did. And now the king asked question and said, well, forget about it. If, if you do now, I will all, all well and good. And this is amazing. Don't miss this. If you have your Bible with you, turn your eyes to verse 16. I'm going to read from 16 to 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Wow. Now, notice how Sadrach, Meshach, just like the king did not wait for their answer, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not wait for the music instruments to be played so that they can bow down and worship. You see, the king said, when this music played, then you bow down. Let's see, will you do that? They didn't wait for the music to come on. To come on and then they respond and said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. And um, now in verse 17, have a look at your Bible, verse 17. There's a slight mistranslation in your English. If you use English Bible, <clears throat> I search a, a few English Bible translation, not just ESV that we use as a church, but also other translation. Most English Bible or all the one that I've looked at have a incorrect or mistranslation on verse 17. It says on, on verse 17, it's like this. Um, if this be so, our God whom we serve, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. That is a mistranslation. The Hebrew text of this actually, if our God whom we serve is able to save us, if our God is able to save us, then he will. Why is it a mistranslation in our English Bible? Because Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego sounds like they are uncertain and unsure that God is able. And that is what the original Hebrew text says. If our God is able to save us, then he will save us. So they're not sure. They were not certain that God is able to save them from the fiery furnace. Yet, this is interesting. They have faith 
in that if God is able, He will save them. Why? Because they know that God is good. So in essence, they're saying, I, I'm not sure if God is able, but if God is able, He will save us because I know, we know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, we know that God is good. That's all and good, but then read verse 18. This is even more interesting. Verse 18 say, but if not, if God is not able or if God did not save us, but if not, be it known to your king that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that we have set up. Basically say, even if not. So, but if not, we will not bow down. We will not obey you. Why? Why they do that? Well, this is interesting because what they're saying is, yes, we may not be unsure. We may be unsure that God is able to rescue us in that fiery furnace. We know God is good, but also what they're saying is this. We know who God is and that is enough. We know who God is. We do not need our God to be able to save us. We, will, we, will, we do not need our God to save us but we will not bow down to you, O King, or the image that you have set up because we know who our God is. Do you know your God? Do you know the God of the Bible with such a faith like this, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? See, religious and irreligious people, uh, when they bow down, when they obey, when they conform, they want a return of investment. They want something in return for their obedience. For their conformity however christians are different you see christians are different in the way that we worship and obey god for who god is just like shadrach meshach and abednego even though there's a possibility here very high chance that they will be burned to death that god will not rescue them because they're not sure if god is able to rescue them in that way so we obey, they obey nonetheless. They worship God because they know who God is. They did not worship, they did not conform and obey God because of what God can do for them. But they know who God is. Uh, if God is who He say He is, then He deserves our worship regardless whether or not we get something in return. And for Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, that is enough. For them, uh, whether or not God rescue them, it does not matter. They still gonna worship God, because if God is God, if God is the creator of the universe, God is the creator of everything, and there is no other gods before God, Yahweh, then He deserves our worship, no matter what. Now, of course, we have seen in the Bible, even uh, in Daniel, that God gives favor. To his children, even here, right? In in we, we have read previously that God favors Daniel and his people. But even if not, even fa even if there's no favor from God, if God is who he say he is, then God deserves our worship and to obey him regardless. So this statement of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego for not waiting for the music to even come on and, and respond in such a way made the king furious. Let's read from 19 to 23. Things get interesting now. Verse 19, Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven more times than it was usually heated, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown in the burning fiery furnace because the king's order was so urgent, the furnace overheated. The flames of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning fire furnace. Uh, pop quiz. How many times the burning, the, 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 the fiery furnace were heated? How many times was it heated? Some people say seven times more. Uh, well, the question, the, the answer is wrong because the, the, 
the king won seven times to be hotter than usual, but then because the, the king was furious and the requests were urgent, the man was rushing into it. And it says here, because the king's order was urgent, the furnace overheated. So it was heated more, more than seven times more. You see, maybe 10 times more. Uh, who knows? In those days, they don't have a button to say like, you know, twice, like 100 degree, 200 degree, 300 degrees. They don't have those knob. Uh, so they probably just chuck more woods in, a lot more woods in. And it was ho so overheated that even the flames from the outside burned the certain men, the, some of these mighty men who took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were dead from the outside. Imagine Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were bound and thrown into the burning fiery furnace. So... What happened next is uh, what we're going to look at, isn't it? So that's what happened the, in, in, in chapter 3 of what we read so far, the oppositions of faith and the tests of faith that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego has to experience. Now let's, let's look at the third point, the triumph of faith. And let us read from verse 24, Daniel 3, verse 24 to 27. This is what happened. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselor, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? The answer and said to the king, True, O king, he answered and said, But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace, he declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire and the satraps, here's the list again, the satraps and the prefects and the governors and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads were not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Wow, how amazing that is. And um, because such an amazing story, sometimes we, off, we, we can miss the point here. Uh, triumph of faith for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not come before the fire. It comes after the fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to be thrown into the fiery furnace. They did not escape it, you see. They were thrown into it. Sometimes we miss that point that triumph comes through the fire, in the fire. See, God rescue is not to deal often time for our faith, for the sake of our faith and our our uh, sanctification and our growth and our maturity. God's rescue is not to deliver us from the fire, but through the fire. Just like fire purifies gold, sufferings and persecution purifies and refines our faith in God. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 6 to 7 says this. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 6 to 7. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The test of our faith, the triumph of faith comes through fire so that God be glorified the, to, for the praise and glory of our Lord Jesus Christ's name. Your suffering, the persecution that you are experiencing, the oppositions that you're experiencing, you are being taken into the fire. Why? The, to, refines and, to refine our faith and the result of that is to glorify God the praise and glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the, the oppositions of Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came uh, pledging loyalty to the king. 
we obey you. These, these three Jews did not. They pledged their loyalty to the king. It, it appears that they have nothing to lose, isn't it? When, when you pledge or loyalty to the king in power, you have nothing to lose, everything to gain. Quite the opposite for, what, for, for uh, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, they appear to have everything to lose by pledging their, their disobedience, by pledging their loyalty towards Yahweh. They have everything to lose. Yet, uh, we see this certain man, that, that our text, or my English Bible say, some of the mighty men, the king's mighty men. It's actually the this, this sum here um, is the same word as certain Chaldeans, the word certain. Certain Chaldeans that accuse certain Jews. This is certain mighty men of God. They were unquestioningly obedient to the king, yet they were the one who were consumed by the fire. The king's men died in fire, though they were not in the fire. And ironically, Sadrach, Misha, and Abednego were triumphant through the fire, in the fire. Do you see that? It's not about whether or not you are being persecuted, you experience sufferings, but who is it? Who is it that is with you through those suffering? And in this case, we read there's a fourth person in that fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And from where King Nebuchadnezzar's point of view, you know, he must be a distant away because he doesn't want to get be consumed by the fire. He saw there four people walking in the fire instead of just three. Now, <clears throat> obedience, our obedience to God may seem like disobedience sometimes to the world. See, your obedience to the, to, to the Bible, to, the, to what the Bible commands us, may seem like disobedience, disloyalty, intolerant to the world. And that is, that is given. That is predictable. That is, the Bible tells us it will happen. Now, I want to share a little bit of story. I'm going to read this. It's a bit long, but bear with me. So a couple of years ago, I, there's, a, there's a Chinese pastor, and, and along with his leaders of the church, they were arrested by the government. He was later sentenced for nine years in prison for disobeying um, the government. He was defiant till the end, and he wrote uh, a declaration, and it's published online, you can search for this. He wrote a declaration, what he called as a declaration of faithful disobedience. And I'm going to read part of this, okay? It's still, it's very long, so I'm going to cut it down, and it's still long, even after I cut it down. So bear with me this de declaration of faithful disobedience. On the basis of the teachings of the Bible and the mission of the gospel, I respect the authorities God has established in China, for God disposes kings and raises up kings. As a pastor of a Christian church, I have my own understanding and views based on the Bible about what righteous order and good government is. At the same time, I'm filled with anger and disgust at the persecution of the church by this communist regime, at the wickedness of their depriving people of the freedoms of religions and con conscience. But changing social and political institution is not the mission I have been called to, and it is not the goal for which God has given his people the gospel. For all hideous realities, unrighteous politics, and arbitrary laws manifest the cross of Jesus Christ, the only means by which every Chinese person must be saved. As a pastor, my, belief in the my firm belief in the gospel, my teaching, and my rebuking of all evil proceeds from Christ's command in the gospel and from the unfathomable love of that glorious King. Every man's life is extremely short, and God fervently commands the church to lead and call any man to repentance who is willing to repent. 
Christ is eager and willing to forgive all who turn from their sins. I accept and respect the fact that this communist regime has been allowed by God to rule temporarily as the Lord's servants. John Calvin said, wicked rulers are the judgment of God on, on a wicked people. The goal being to urge God's people to repent and to turn again towards Him. For this reason, I'm joyfully willing to submit myself to the enforcement of the law as though submitting to the discipline and training of the Lord. At the same time, I believe that this communist regime's persecution against the church is a greatly, is greatly wicked, unlawful action. As a pastor of a Christian church, I must denounce this wickedness openly and severely. The calling that I have received requires me to use non-violent methods to disobey those human laws that disobey the Bible and God. My Savior Christ also requires me to joyfully bear all costs for disobeying wicked law. But this does not mean that my personal disobedience and the disobedience of the church is in any sense fighting for rights or political activism in the form of civil disobedience. As a pastor, the only thing I care about is the disruptions of man's sinful nature by this faithful disobedience and the testimony it bears for the cross of Christ. As a pastor, my faithful disobedience is one part of the gospel commission. Christ's great commission requires us great disobedience. The goal of disobedience is not to change the world, but to testify about another world. If I'm imprisoned for a long or short period of time, if I can help reduce the authority's fear of my faith and of my Savior, I'm very joyfully willing to help them in this way. But I know that only when I renounce all the wickedness of this persecution against the church and use peaceful means to disobey, will I truly be able to help the souls of the authorities and law enforcement. I hope God uses me by means of first losing my personal wisdom to tell those who have deprived me of my personal freedom that there is an authority higher than their authority and that there is a freedom that they cannot restrain, a freedom that fills the church of the crucified and risen Jesus Christ. Those who lock me up will one day be locked up by angels. Those who in interrogate, interrogate me will finally be questioned and judged by Christ. When I think of this, the Lord fills me with a natural compassion and grief towards those who are attempting to and actively imprisoning me. Pray that the Lord would use me, that he would grant me patience and wisdom that I may take the gospel to them. Jesus is the Christ, Son of the eternal living God. He died for sinners and rose to life for us. He is my King, the King of the whole earth, yesterday, today, and forever. I am His servant and I am imprisoned because of this. I will resist in meekness to those who resist God. And I will joyfully violate all laws that violate God's laws. That is one powerful declaration. If we are to be disobedient, it's because we are, because of our obedience to God's law. There is higher authority than the authority of man. He is our Lord Jesus, the King of Kings. Now let me read from us by way of closing from Daniel 3 verses 28 to 29. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angels and delivered his servant, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I made a decree. Any people, nation, language that speaks anything against the God of Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb to limb, and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Um, has Nebuchadnezzar changed 
a little bit perhaps, but not completely. It's not his God. He, he did not confess to this Yahweh to be his God. This is, this is the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. However, he has something insightful to say at the end of that. He says, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. And he is right. Yahweh rescue like no other God's rescue. There is no other God who rescue like our God, the God of the Bible. Our God rescue us by taking the punishment we deserve. And he put it on his own begotten son, Jesus. No other God, no other king does that. He rescued by taking the punishment on himself. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not bow down and worship to the idol King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they did so even though they, they were unsure that God is able. Remember the mistranslation? If God is able, so they were unsure. Even though they were unsure, they refused to worship and bow down an idol. However, unlike Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we can be sure that God is able. Not only that our God is able, He had sent His Son to save us all by taking off place in the fiery furnace. The Bible has a clear reference uh, multiple times in the New Testament also mentioned that wicked people will be thrown into the fiery furnace. However, there's no other God who is able to rescue you in this way like our God by taking the fiery furnace on himself on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, he did that on our behalf so that you and I did not have to be thrown into the fiery furnace. Now my questions for all of us is this. Will you not live faithfully and obey our Lord Jesus Christ for the rest of your life? Even if it is means, even if it means faithful disobedience in the eyes of the world, in the eyes of other people who do not share the same belief as you are. Let's think about that. Will you not now live faithfully, even if it means faithful disobedience in the eyes of the people? Let's close our eyes.